Good evening, everybody. It's really great to be here in the nice, warm sunshine. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, disparity, as Dr. Moeller said in that lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, but to start with, I want to tell you how I got into this field. I was a little girl, long time ago. I drove my mother and my grandmother crazy. Always ask why. They'd answer why. How do you have children or grandchildren like that? Yeah, I had one too. And oh, they would just they would just drive them crazy. I also grew up in New York City in Manhattan. I developed a very strong um, sense of what right is, thank you, of right and, and um, equality. And, you know, uh, both of those traits are the perfect traits for an epidemiologist, which is what I am. How many of you ever heard of epidemiology? I know Gloria has. Okay. So epidemiology comes from Greek. I'm also Greek, so this is good, which means <laughs> the study of diseases that befall upon the people. And it also in, in, includes description, causes, and prevention. And many of us have se uh, specialties in epidemiology, infectious disease epidemiology, genetics, behavior, and cancer. And I link the bo bottom two, behavior and cancer, together in addressing disparities. So you might ask, what are disparities? So disparities are differences in disease risk factors, what causes disease, the occurrence of disease or death that shouldn't exist. And they're defined in different populations, for example, the elderly or pediatric patients, by race or ethnicity, income, education, or geography, for example, rural areas or urban areas, and gender. Yes, um, sometimes women are, are um, defined in this group. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples, okay? We have men here. Where are my men in the audience, okay? So men have a prostate, and men develop prostate cancer. And this graph just shows that as men age, the numbers of prostate cancers increase. Okay? What is the rate in women? <laughs> Zero. Okay? This is a difference. Is it a disparity? No, it's not a disparity because it should exist. All right? So now I'm going to show you what is a disparity. These are death rates from breast cancer in black women in the pink line and white women in the gray line. You can see that early on in about the 1980s, or the, the rates were about the same, the, the chances of dying. But look what happened starting in about the early 90s. The rates went down in white women and didn't really go down in black women. This is a disparities. And this says that, that African-American women who live in Chicago are 62% more likely to die from breast cancer than white women who live in Chicago. Now, why does this happen? Why do disparities exist? And I'm going to share with you a really unique lens that we have developed at Ohio State to look at why disparities exist. And then if you can understand why, then you can change that picture. So um, African-American men have the highest death rate for lung cancer in the, in the country. Now, is that just because African-American men smoke? And many researchers just focus on this one issue. It's because these, these men smoke. It's not. It's because of all of these factors together. And let me paint the picture for you. They are more likely to live in states with low tax and greater production of tobacco, low tax on tobacco. And we know that people who live in those states are more likely to smoke. They probably work at, at jobs where they're allowed smoke breaks, allowed to smoke at, smoke at the workplace, and less likely to be offered smoking cessation by their doctors. We, we know this from studies. 
They're more likely to live in areas where there are tobacco ads or stores that sell tobacco near their home and they have ads that tailor smoking to them. These ads you can see are tailored to African American populations and the ads actually are larger in size. They have family members who smoke and our research has demonstrated that if you have a family member or your social network smokes, you are less likely to stop smoking. They also smoke menthol cigarettes. The tobacco companies know that and they market the menthol cigarettes to them. And there's also been shown in research that there is a genetic susceptibility not only to addiction to tobacco, but also to susceptibility to smoking menthol cigarettes. So you put this all together, and this is why disparities exist. So how are we working to reduce disparities? We have a secret weapon, and that is called patient navigation. Many of you might have heard about patient navigators and patient navigation programs, but I'll just review what patient navigation is first. It is really support by trained healthcare workers, and we don't necessarily use nurses, we use lay health workers, healthcare workers, to make sure that the patient receives timely diagnosis and treatment. And the way they do it, this is the secret sauce, is they identify the individual barrier that each patient has to receiving the care that the doctor wants them to receive. Every person has a different barrier. And so the navigator identifies those and addresses them. So let me, let me share with you some stories. First of all, we'll, we'll talk about these in general, about what navigators do. Many of you feel when you go to the doctor's office that it's like a maze. You don't know what to do. So the navigators guide the patients through this confusing maze of the healthcare experience. They translate the medical jargon, they provide support, emotional support, whatever is needed, they help schedule appointments, and they address the barriers that the person has to care. So let's tell you first of all of, um, we'll call him Mr. Smith. So Mr. Smith is a, an African American man and he um, had rectal bleeding and his doctor said, you need to have a colonoscopy. Now, how many of us have had that wonderful colonoscopy? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Smith did not want to get a colonoscopy. And in, in fact, he worked um, in a blue collar job where he said he didn't get sick days. And so um, my navigator worked with him over several months and told him, you can take a vacation day. We can schedule your colonoscopy for a Monday. She actually turned up, uh, had to drive him to the appointment because he had no family to take him. It's a good thing he went because he had a five centimeter polyp removed, which is a pre-cancer. So we prevented a cancer in this gentleman. This is Mrs. Ali. Mrs. Ali was successfully treated for breast cancer. She lives in, um, she's one of our Somali uh, community residents in, in Columbus. And her doctor told her she needed to take her medicine to prevent her cancer coming back. She wanted to take her medicine. My navigator went to visit her, and she was very concerned because her medication didn't come in the mail, and the doctor told her the medication was gonna be coming in the mail. So my navigator called the post office. Well, yes, the postman came. He knocked on the door. Mrs. Ali is deaf. And nobody had thought to tell anybody that she needed this wonderful device. So my navigator called Deaf Services and they got this installed very quickly and Miss Ali was able to get her medication. The populations know what they need. They just have barriers they don't know how to overcome to get those services. Ohio Appalachia, we do a lot of work in Ohio Appalachia, beautiful area. But the color coding indicates, the lighter color indicates um, no mammography facilities in the entire county. That's the white counties. And the Peach counties have one facility. How are women supposed to get mammograms? There's no public transportation there to take them. So we got a grant from Coleman Columbus and we were able to bring the James mammogram van there and um, go into the communities and get women scheduled and qualify them for a mammogram so that they're able to um, get the care they need. 
Some of you might know of my colleague, uh, Heather Hempel, who runs the Ohio Colorectal Cancer Prevention Initiative. We work with Heather where they screened uh, 3,000 colon cancer patients in Columbus looking for the Lynch uh, syndrome. And we, in a separate project, counsel through patient navigation on the phone, family members give them their personal prescription for colorectal cancer screening based on the genetic information and address barriers that these relatives have to receiving that care. Those are individual stories. How does this impact healthcare in general or healthcare from a system level? We talked about that lovely colonoscopy exam. What happens when the exam is scheduled, the appointment's scheduled, and the patient doesn't show? What's the impact on the patients in general? Like we talked about, Mr. Smith. What about the clinic? What's the lost revenue when nobody shows up and everybody's waiting? Can patient navigation help? We call our patient navigation program the Wayfinder program, and we have a small grant funded by the medical center, and we went into the colonoscopy clinic. And the no-show rate before we started was a little about 32%. If my, if my navigator can get a hold of the patients, the no-show rate is 6%. 80% reduction. So I, th I think the numbers are going through your head if you think a colonoscopy might cost $1,000 a pop. What's the return on investment? And this is the missing piece of evidence we have in, in our knowledge about patient navigation. And what ultimately is the impact on disparities for these programs? Well, when we talk about leaving disparities behind, navigation is the answer. And the things that we are doing to move it forward at Ohio State are first, we're adding to the scientific knowledge base that navigation works. This is a study we're doing in rural Ohio and Indiana to try to get women to get colon, breast, and cervical cancer screening. I mentioned return on investment. We are adding to the evidence that really is not out there about the return on investment when an institution will pay for navigators. What's the return on investment to that institution for having navigators in terms of reducing no-shows? We are part of national policy, establishing national policy on patient navigation. This is a meeting that was just held by the National Academy of Medicine. And we at Ohio State have a unique model of patient navigation called continuum of care navigation. We navigate from the community to the clinic, and we facilitate screening, diagnosis, and treatment. So, uh, as well as now into survivorship. So, it really takes a team to win. And this is my team, my team of navigators both in the community as well as in the clinic. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>